الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين الحمد لله Central Jamia Mosque in Gold Sharif has launched the beginning of the year this library in Gold Sharif Library and we have a number of uh, initiatives to uh, spread knowledge, spread education and uh, create passion for learning and reading. One of them is that we will be hosting monthly lectures within the library revolving around literature, revolving around uh, the books that you see here. So in January we had our Imam Allama Muhammad Mubashir Iqbal Hafizahullah Ta'ala deliver a talk on Masjid Al-Aqsa and the Holy Lands and mashallah that's available on our YouTube channel GS Mosque to see and he covered the history of Masjid Al-Aqsa and a beautiful tour mashallah we had some excellent feedback from that uh, now mashallah in February this is our second talk uh, Gum Gold Sharif library talk this is delivered by our Honorable Shaykh Asrar Hafizahullah Ta'ala entitled Importance of Reading in Times of Illiteracy How to Approach Books and Reading So inshallah uh, these uh, initiatives will be uh, catalysts for our community, for ourselves, for our family members to get into reading, to get into literature inshallah Our next library event will be on uh, uh, Sunday the 27th of March just before Ramadan starts um, I'll be delivering that, inshallah. That will be a summary of Imam Ghazali's uh, Kitab al Som, inshallah. So, um, without further delay, I would hand over the stage and your attentions to the Shaykh. Pay attention, inshallah, and um, the time is in the Shaykh's hands. Uh, however, he decides to split up the time, and inshallah, whatever time he gives for a QA, so keep your questions in mind. And when we do move to the QA, uh, formulate your questions properly as well so that you can ask them properly and save time. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Hamd al-Shakirin. Was salatu was salamu ala Sayyidil Mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Tibbil qulubi wa dawaiha wa nur al-absari wa diyaiha wa afiyat al-abdani wa shifaiha. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكرك الغافلون. A few things to cover inshallah today with regard to this important subject, pertinent subject, very important in our worldly and religious lives. Literacy in an age of illiteracy. Now, why would we say today is an age of illiteracy when According to censuses, uh, 99 or 100% of people within the UK are supposedly literate, are able to read and write. Of course, these statistics are flawed because there are people, even if they go through the education system, they are still unable to read. Not because of some disability, but because of not acquiring a skill that should be inculcated within their young minds from a young age into their adulthood. An important skill that we can never undermine. Even for people who are termed in, in today's day and age as being working class. What, what is referred to as working class, meaning their social status in terms of income, postcode, these type of things, they are bracketed as being working class and therefore some people deem them not being able to read or having access to literature which is untrue from our Islamic tradition because in our Islamic tradition even the likes of Imam Abu Hamid Al-Ghazali he was an orphan from being an orphan he became Imam Al-Ghazali likewise Imam Al-Bukhari Muhammad bin Ismail Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, his father died when he was a young child, yet he became Imam Al-Bukhari. So in terms of income bracket, there is no association of income with literacy from an Islamic perspective. The first verse of Al-Quran Al-Kareem revealed the first five verses, of course we know, were from Surah Al-Iqra. Surah Al-Iqra 
meaning recite. And of course, the recitation was in reference to the recitation of Al Quran Al Karim. And Al Quran Al Karim laid down the foundations of literacy, not only for Arabs, but when the Al Khilafat Al Islamiyya expanded, its geographical borders grew the people of former civilizations who were very educated. So you had the Copts in Egypt that when Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an, his armies entered into Egypt, the libraries of Alexandria were drawn into the Islamic civilization. We know, for instance, that the translation of all Greek philosophy and Greek literature was commissioned by the Abbasi Caliphs. So the foundations of literacy for Muslims and Arabs and Persians and whoever fell within the borders of the Islamic Caliphate, those foundations were laid by Al Quran Al Karim, the revelation of Al Quran Al Karim. Imagine people that even if they were from a rural background, a rural background without access to the universities of Baghdad, without access to the universities of Fas. In that time, someone from a rural background will still have memorized Al Quran Al Karim, an entire book, and be able to write out Al Quran Al Karim and understand Al Quran Al Karim. So, for instance, in Mauritania, to this day, they still write on the loh that you have people in a rural area sitting down, being able to read and write even though that they have no access to modern means of education. But the Quran has ensured that such people still remain literate. Now, literate, the word, firstly, when we refer to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Al-Ummi, we do not translate this as illiterate. We cannot refer to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as being illiterate. Al-Ummi does not mean this. Anyone who does this, they make a mistake. The word Al-Ummi is from Um. Um is the source of something. So the mother is referred to as Um. The mother is referred to as Um. Likewise, Um Kitab, the mother of books. So someone who is Al-Ummi is referred to their mother, ascribed to their mother, because the way they came out of the womb of their mother, they were unable to read and write. They ascribe them to their mother and say, Al-Ummi. But when this ascription is given to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's a praise, Madh. Why? Because a person who was never taught by any other human being or by jinn, or by anyone in creation was able to recite Al Quran Al Karim and teach an entire nation, instruct an entire nation. So the word Al Ummi for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a praise, and you can never utilize the word illiterate. The correct translation would be untaught, meaning untaught by anyone in creation, the one who was instructed and taught by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the teachings were conveyed by Sayyiduna Jibreel alayhi salam in many cases. So the Quran laid down the foundations of civilization in the sense that Ahlu Sufa, they would sit near the area which is known as Dukkatul Aghwaf today in Al Masjid al Nabawi al Sharif, the, behind the blessed grave of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Firstly, you have uh, the area which was designated by Nuruddin Zangi rahimallah, the elevated area. This was designated by Nuruddin Zangi rahimallah. There is a similar area in al Jami al umawi in the Grand Umayyad Masjid, because of the type of architecture from those times. Behind that is Dukkatul Aghwath, and we know the companions Ali Muridwan would sit in this area waiting for revelation of al Quran al Karim to write down the verses of Al-Quran Al-Kareem, memorize Al-Quran Al-Kareem. And we know Al-Quran Al-Kareem, firstly, Al-Quran Al-Kareem has dastur, has a constitution for an entire civilization. 
The proof of that is 1300 years of caliphate, a system of governance that was not a utopia. We do not claim it was a utopia, but yet it was a system of governance for that governed an entire region for 1300 years. What was the constitution for this system of governance for 1300 years? The constitution was Al-Qur'anul Karim. Al-Qur'anul Karim has verses that may contain 60 or so words and over 30 ahkam, 30 legal rulings. Meaning that is the level of eloquence contained within Al-Qur'anul Karim. Al-Qur'anul Karim laid down the foundations of of algebra so the laws of the ilmul mirath inheritance laws which are contained in surah al nisa those laws where the portions are mentioned a suduth which is one sixth a thuluth a thuluthan a third two thirds a rub a fourth a thumun an eighth and then a nisf a half all of these portions led and inspired an entire civilization to form the laws of algebra. Even the word algebra is from algebra to fix something. So uh, 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 we know Al Khwarizmi was one of the f founders of uh, algebra and he even wrote uh, a book, uh, Al Khwarizmi. And we know that the word algorithm is from Al Khwarizmi, from the word itself. But the point being that the foundation of literacy and the literacy that was found in the early generations of Muslims was inspired by Al-Quran Al-Kareem but also inspired by the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so Abu Bakr Ahmad bin Thabit Al-Baghdadi Rahimallahu Ta'ala who is known as Al-Khatib Al-Baghdadi the writer of the work Tariq Al-Baghdad the history of Baghdad and so many other and we have the book here Tariq al-Baghdad, so many other works in Ilm al-Hadith, they say his Majalis al-Hadith, al-Sharif, were filled. That And this is in the 5th century. So from the early students of Hadith, from the time of the companions, Ali Muridwan, up until the 5th century, they say the Masajid were filled with Majalis al-Hadith. What were these Majalis al-Hadith? A, a Hadith scholar would sit down, sometimes from memory so the likes of al imam muhammad bin ismail al bukhari rahimallah he would sit down with his memory meaning his memory as an aid he would give citations from the ahadith of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sitting down and then what would people do they would write down those ahadith meaning writing and reading being inspired by Al Quran Al Karim and the Ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those majalis were so filled that they say at one time a scholar of Hadith sneezed in the gathering. So he said, Alhamdulillah. And the entire crowd said, Yarhamukallah. The voice of the crowd or the sound of the crowd chanting Yarhamukallah reached the palace of the Caliph. And they, the caliph inquired what was that noise and he was informed that a scholar of hadith has sneezed meaning the gatherings of hadith were filled to that extent that people would fill the masajid with gatherings of hadith so the masajid were are constructed for two purposes aside from other things one is what dhikrullah which is what the five daily prayers recitation of the quran dhikrullah in, in general and then the second is what learning so the, mas the masajid are that place where people attend to learn so th they are inspired to learn the meanings of the Quran the Sunnah the Ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the books of Al Fiqh not only Majalis Al Hadith even grammar Arabic grammar the foundations were laid down in that early period so for instance, Abu al-Aswad al-Du'li rahimahullah, who was the companion of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, he laid down the foundations of al-Nahaw, which is what Arabic grammar. And the famous story is that 
at one point he went home and he went on top of the roof with his wife and daughter and they were observing the stars and the daughter wanted to praise the beauty of the stars and she said something incorrect in Arabic grammar ما أجمل السماء وما أجمل السماء she made a mistake so this worried him so he went to Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an informing Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an that the new generation is losing their eloquence and grammar so Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an said write down the principles of Arabic of the spoken Arabic meaning grammar so he said what shall I write so he said kullu kullu fa'ilin marfu'un write down kullu fa'ilin marfu'un meaning and these are what uh, axioms of Arabic grammar which became rules and regulations or al-qawaid um, maxims to govern Arabic grammar kullu fa'ilin marfu'un every subject is in the nominative state so he wrote this down then he said write down كُلُّ مَفْعُولٍ منصوبٌ. Every مفعول is what? منصوب. So every object is what? In the accusative state. So he wrote this down. So Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an said, أُنْحُ نَحْوَ هَذَا أُنْحُ meaning go in this direction like this. نَحْوَ هَذَا meaning write down all the rules. And therefore, the science itself became known as علم النحو. Now, as I mentioned, algebra also, at one point, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an was on the member of Al-Kufa. While giving a khutbah on the member of Kufa, a man entered the masjid and he, he mentioned Mas'alatul Miraf, a question on inheritance laws. He said, my mother and my father have passed away and my wife has... Um, a man has died and he has left a mother and a father and children, daughters, exceeding three. And he has left what? He has left uh, a wife. And straight away, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. so the, f the fractions are what? One sixth, one sixth, one eighth and a third. Yes, these are the four. From, so from these, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an straight away calculated that the shares are from the number 27. Subhanallah. Without, meaning if that was any one of us, we would take out the calculator we would, or a piece of paper. But the, these type of sciences were intuitive for the likes of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So, these type of responses regarding Islamic issues laid down the foundations of other aspects of Islamic civilization, like determining the direction of the Qibla, which involves geometry, uh, determining the month of Ramadan, which involves astronomy, determining e even the direction of the Qibla involves stargazing, because when you are in the northern hemisphere, you travel downwards towards the south, towards the Kaaba. Of course, six constellations are in the northern hemisphere, six constellations in the southern hemisphere. You travel towards the Kaaba, there are certain stars that are, are in close proximity to Mecca al mukarrama So stargazing, writing down the names of the stars, even a, a, a Rijl, so Rijl publishing, a Rijl, is what a star named by the Arabs. Why did they even bother observing the stars? Because of what? Because of the religion of Islam. So, the direction of the Qibla, awqatu salah, for which spherical uh, geometry and spherical trigonometry were essential. And therefore they wrote books. Uh, today over a thousand manuscripts exist just on the subject of astronomy, trigonometry and geometry written in that time in order to preserve these things 
for ibadat acts of worship all inspired by al quran al karim so this was the age of literacy literacy inspired by al quran al karim literacy inspired by the ahadith and the sunnah of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is the purpose of having a library in the masjid having durus in the masajid having lessons being taught within the masajid in order to inspire literacy this masjid from many years for nearly 20 years now over, or over 20 years ago was one of the focal points of where students of my age group would after having lessons with al-allama rasul baq saidi they would come to this masjid to revise in the masjid hall so at that time the masjid hall at night time was quiet meaning there was no public in the evening times and they would sit in the masjid hall and revise so so many lessons of nahw mir i have taught in that masjid hall lessons of nahw mir to dozens of students that have memorized those lessons because the masjid was the right environment for them to learn literacy so literacy here means arabic literacy so they were learning arabic grammar and becoming literate in what in arabic but the masjid environment is the best environment for learning now going on to the subject of reading in an age of illiteracy what is the illiteracy in today's day and age the illiteracy today is not that people do not learn how to read the illiteracy is that once they have acquired the skill of learning they do not maintain reading and they are not inspired to continuously read so what happens with uh, again to use the the phrases of the western class system the middle class is that they may read novels so novels are a very common way of people acquiring a habit of reading that they buy novels and they read this is why when a book is published in in the west tens and thousands of copies are sold tens and thousands of copies are read many times there are novels but also books of expertise books of academia many hundreds of books are sold thousands in some case of academia also how is this an age of illiteracy the illiteracy is the fact that people who have acquired the skill of reading from school are still not inspired to expand and broaden their horizon of learning so what they have learned in school is forgotten and then when they enter the workplace within the workplace the system or the model of the workplace is to create is to have robots that work within that routine nine to five to go home uh, to watch television in an age of literacy literacy or illiteracy meaning a paradoxical uh, world that we live in in the old times people would sit near fires and when the fire would burn an old man would tell them stories or someone who was able to read would read out something and that was their entertainment so in, people who worked in the fields all day they would farm in the fields when they would finish uh, firstly they were in touch with nature when they would come home they would light a fire and some person would tell them stories they would talk there was converse, conversation interaction amongst the people familiarity community but in the time of technology there is a lack of familiarity for instance when people sit on the bus you will observe that everyone is observing not a book not reading a book they will be on uh, the new technology which is known as the smartphone so they sit on the smartphone people do not interact and the smartphone has its uses that are meaning benefits in the sense that a person can acquire news uh, information they can check information but a problem with that is when a person does a quick google check they may think that they have acquired the correct facts 
but they have not gained the expertise. It's like someone needing information on how to fix a car. They quickly check on Google, but the difference between that person who does a quick check and an, a mechanic who works in a garage with cars day in, day out, there is a disparity, a world of difference between the two. Similarly, a doctor, a person can check up a, a particular disease on Google, but the way a doctor will know the symptom through his expertise, it is not the same. So there, while there are benefits, there are people who think that they may become experts by doing a quick check on Google. So, like, the difference between a lawyer, a person, a solicitor works day in, day out with the law, has his expertise in the courts, and someone doing a quick Google check regarding the law. So this is a type of illiteracy. Secondly, social media, which has in in the in the past two decades really changed the mindset of not only the new generation the old generation people who are uh, always on social media they are unable to concentrate for long hours in order to read a book so they cannot read a book because they concentrate on facebook even though they do not realize the amount of facebook posts they may read or Instagram posts they may read, they do not realize that in that time they would have completed a book. The obsession with which some people may write on the internet, they would have completed a, an entire book, writing out an entire book. They do not realize that they have the skill, but they are misusing the skill, uh, entertaining social media trolls. And this is how Facebook is designed. So the designers of Facebook, this is why they even have the, the sound, the ping sound, in order to give you an addiction to having a back and forth on social media. And unfortunately, when this enters the Islamic domain, when uh, within the Islamic domain, where everyone becomes an expert on Islam on the internet, on Facebook. So... People will give a fatwa and the person gives a counter fatwa, a takfir, and a counter takfir, a tabdir and a counter tabdir, a tafsiq, counter tafsiq, declaring Muslims disbelievers, innovators, a fusaq, transgressors, meaning extremes of all natures. So the internet is one of the main reasons as to why people have lost concentration in reading so this is why as a teacher when I communicate with younger students they say to me we cannot concentrate when we read a book why because they have not customized their brains their minds to read they have dopamine a, a dopamine rush from entertainment on the internet so other systems of entertainment uh, television is old of course, in the 80s and the 90s, television was the main distraction and uh, video films. And then from the 2000s, uh, the internet and the smartphone and then social media. And now in the next decade, we will be facing another challenge, which is this uh, metaverse, a virtual world where we, we will have younger people, <coughs> not only younger people, people older than the younger generation sitting all day observing a virtual moon <laughs> so when ramadan comes they'll observe the crescent in, in the virtual world already you have a sudais the imam of the haram in makkah kissing a virtual black stone so this is a, a challenge for the future that we will have that where in the masjid we may be sitting in the masjid all day waiting for students, waiting for people to attend the library, but they are sitting in the comfort of their own homes in a wor virtual world, buying Gumgol Sharif Masjid, buying the plot in the virtual world, <laughs> sitting in the virtual library, reading virtual books. So this, this is the type of the Jalik times that are approaching uh, and creeping up upon us. Of course, 
sometimes uh, in previous times people would say poverty is one of the main reasons why people do not read but sometimes affluence can be a distraction from reading also in reality it's on the person himself or herself to acquire the habit of what of reading so what so this is what i mean by a time of illiteracy that someone may have acquired the skill of reading and writing by the way reading and writing is a skill acquired in a few months within a few months a person can read and write within a few months after instruction but then how do we go from having the skill of reading and writing but now going into application in terms of becoming a reader who benefits from what he reads many people ask the question that am i prohibited from reading novels and i tell them no it's absolutely permitted for people to read novels and literature so they become surprised how can we read novels and literature why are you not guiding us to islamic literature firstly who said i negated reading islamic literature but reading in the broad sense how does a person acquire the habit of reading firstly they must read what they are interested in so i, I can recommend a book for instance hadith literature books and someone acquires a book on hadith literature they read a few pages they find the the words difficult technical terms jargon what we refer to as istilahat for professionals of that field and the mind switches off because this is not the field of the person so by recommending islamic books there are people whose minds may switch off because they have not acquired the habit of reading in their youth and therefore they find concentrating difficult so how do you acquire the the concentration that is needed in reading the response is that you start with books that interest you you start with subjects that interest you so every year thousands of books are released in the english language thousands and this adds up to the british library catalog a long extended catalog and you will have so many topics to choose from so firstly a person should start with subjects that interest them for instance some people find autobiographies interesting some people find biographies of of people interesting does it mean the biography of someone you who is necessarily religious the answer is no you may even read the bio autobiography of nelson mandela for instance if he interests you some people uh, may be interested in the autobiography of another individual but you start with an autobiography if that interests you or a biography of someone or a field of expertise that interests you secondly the books that you select it is not necessary that the size of the book is humongous meaning a thick book it's not necessary you can start with small books but if you do decide to choose a book uh, which is voluminous or 500 pages long then you pace yourself the best type of book is the type of book that you immerse your mind your mind automatically is immersed sometimes some people who never read they discover a book that interests them to such a degree that they will sit for hours just reading that book until they finish a life changing book there are some books that are life changing books it happens to people they are in a situation some people in prison they go to the prison library they come across a book which then interests them and then they become absorbed by the book uh, absorbed into the book they immerse themselves into the book and they read and concentrate but then afterwards they may have read this particular book but they may attempt to read other books and they are unable to do so why because the interest is not in the mind so you need to first 
Select those books which interest you, the subjects that interest you. You may never read certain books simply because they do not interest you. Pacing yourself means that you have a minimum of pages that you read on a daily basis. This does not mean that you limit yourself to those number of pages. Generally, I tell people to start with 12 pages. So 12 pages a day. If they started with 12 pages a day, remember consistency is the key to all success. Even in learning, consistency is the key. So you may do something small on a daily basis or something you deem as being small, but because you are consistent, it, uh, the, the trickle of water on a daily basis adds up. So there's a famous anecdote which was mentioned to me in the year 1998 by my teacher. He mentioned the scholar that there was an alim from the previous times who reached the age of 40 and had not studied. So he was not an alim at the time. All his life, he herded goats. He, he herded goats. One day it rained. So when it rained, he took refuge under a tree with his flock of goats. One of the goats, the hoof of the goat, was stuck in mud. So he removed the hoof and there was a groove in the ground. From the drops on the branch of the tree, the rain started to pour into the groove. Eventually the groove became a pool of water. From a pool of water, a huge body of water. This made the shepherd think that if every day I acquired a drop of water, a drop of knowledge on a daily basis, today I would have acquired a mass of knowledge, meaning the 40 years of my life. So he went to seek knowledge. And uh, it's not just an anecdote, it's, it's a true story. He mentioned the name of the alim, which I forget now. But he started studying at the age of 40 and he acquired knowledge until he became an alim of the religion, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So consistency is the key, consistency in reading. So on a daily basis, you, firstly, you acquire a book that interests you. Secondly, you are consistent on reading a minimum number of pages, even though I may mention 12 pages, it could be 25, it could be 50. If the book really interests you, you will have a minimum of 50 pages on a daily basis. Like this, you will, you will complete a book within a few days or a week. If the book is 200 pages, definitely within a week. Remember, some technical books will be more difficult to read. So if you acquire a book on Ilmul Kalam, theology, the technical terminology uh, may slow down your reading because you need to understand what you are reading but if the book is easy then the person will pace himself quicker through the book until he reaches the end it's finishing a book always leaves a feeling of what of achievement when you finish a book you have a feeling of achievement that feeling of achievement encourages a person to read more books additionally Acquisition of the habit of reading on a daily basis gives a person the natural dopamine rush that they need as opposed to acquiring dopamine from television, internet, gossip, forums, wasting time on uh, Facebook, social media. Instead of trolling, a person will have his dopamine rush from the book that he reads. Remember, a book imparts more than any other form of knowledge with the acceptance of classes. So classes which entail suhbah, uh, accompanying ulama, that is the first level of knowledge. This is why they say, مَنْ أَخَذَ الْعِلْمَ مِنَ الْكُتُبِ فَعِلْمُهُ عِنْدَ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ غَيْرُ مُعْتَبِرِ that whoever takes his knowledge solely from books, then his knowledge according to the people, people of knowledge is not reliable. Why? Because the experts will 
train him how to read a category, a, a science like Ilm al-Kalam theology. You may read a book, but what you acquire from a teacher who may have taught those books for 40 years is he will give you the shortcut and a quick explanation for those things which if you attempt to resolve yourself with your mind alone, uh, you will uh, spend hours and hours or days or weeks or months attempting to resolve that problem, which an expert can transmit to you within a few minutes. وَمَنْ أَخَذَ الْعِلْمَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ مُشَافَهَةً فَعِلْمُهُ عِنْدَ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ مُعْتَبَرِ Whoever takes his knowledge from the people of knowledge, مُشَافَهَةً Meaning facing them and meeting them, then his knowledge, according to the people of knowledge, is reliable. So fiqh is an example of the jurisprudence, giving fatwa, the methodology. But with a reading, a person acquires the natural relaxation of the mind, the natural pleasure of the mind from becoming a reader uh, with a regular habit, as something which non-readers can never appreciate. So sometimes a person may be an addicting, uh, addictive uh, have an addictive nature of reading, but a non-reader will not be able to relate to that nature of that person because they are not reading themselves. They do not understand what occurs in the mind, what chemicals are being released in the mind. There are natural chemicals that are released when a person acquires new knowledge. Some of you may have felt this when you acquired new knowledge. It brings a, a feeling uh, of uh, relaxation, uh, an uplifting feeling. This is the feeling acquired from reading good literature, good books. So once you become a regular reader, you will always acquire this and the addictions, the bad addictions will fall to the side. A person eventually will, will become addicted to reading because reading imparts m sometimes more experience than people in real life. For instance, if you read the autobiography of Malcolm X, that's what 39 years of his life placed between two covers and a book that he wrote from his heart. You read that, it's an inspiring book. It's in, it has inspired many thousands. Similarly, so many other books, when you read them, a person is giving you sometimes in autobiographies, they are giving you their life experience. That autobiography does not necessarily have to be a Muslim. It can be a non-Muslim. You read the autobiography of an inspiring individual irrelevant to whether they were Muslims or non-Muslims in the sense that they inspire you in other aspects of our worldly life. Inspiring individuals. They give you their experience within two covers. Likewise, books of experts in their fields. Reading the works of people who are experts in their fields like Noam Chomsky, irrelevant to our disagreements on certain things, a, a person who is well read on political science, the geopolitics of the world, a person reads his book and benefits and appreciates the experience of a man who has reached well over 90 years old, living in this world, imparting his experience of geopolitics, of the political nature of the world. Similarly, other modern writers and classical writers, even novels, Classical novels will impart to you a knowledge of a, uh, of a previous age. So if you read Shakespeare, when you read Shakespeare, the M Merchant of Venice or you read Macbeth, nearly all of us read Macbeth in school, or Hamlet, these books contain historical information. They contain lessons. Uh, the stories have lessons within them. They impart language. So it's important never to deprecate literature. In fact, when I was uh, a child, my father would instruct me never to place any book on the floor. So at one point, I said to him, it's just a non-Muslim book. It's just a novel. He said it's still, it still contains language and it still contains knowledge. But my father cannot read and write to the level of uh, other people. But he appreciated what? Knowledge. Appreciated knowledge. In fact, 
he purchased a an encyclopedia virtues encyclopedia virtues encyclopedia for a hundred pound for me for all of our siblings to utilize which he would not have realized that at a later time that would inspire the habit of reading so having uh, never deprecate any books of course uh, with the exception being books that insult al-islam or the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because that's not uh, knowledge that's uh, similar to the the poets of jahiliyyah who would insult the quran and so what do we do that in that case we read the books of the ulama of islam who write in the defense of islam and respond to such type of claims but in the broader literature neutral literature we muslims should acquire knowledge of classical literature whether english literature urdu literature arabic literature there is so much to read in all traditions all cultures so even uh, the the english literature if you are interested in old classical books a person should read them there is no prohibition so when you acquire this habit of reading on a daily basis firstly you have selected books that you are interested in so your mind should not switch off because you are reading what books that interest you some of you may uh, select uh, for instance agatha christie's novels on murder mysteries this is fine why because what you are doing is you are training your mind to read to concentrate you are disassociating your mind from what from being distracted by social media distracted by in the internet so similarly you are training the mind to concentrate with an, a minimum number of pages to read on a daily basis another habit that should be acquired when reading is that when you read you come across words that you are not familiar with so you can underline those words with pencil and then return back to those words and write down the words list all the words so you read for instance you read 50 pages within those 50 pages there will be so many words that you may not know you write down those words then what do you do you check all those words in a dictionary the meanings you also check the pronunciation of the words so this is where the benefit of google comes in you go on google you check british pronunciation there are so many words that we will not know and because we do not utilize those words in conversation we may not know how to pronounce those words so for instance even pronunciation someone may say pronunciation or uh, for instance the word facade f a c a d e a person may re reading this word has never uh, utilized the word and when he has heard the word he ignored the usage of the word he may say facade mm -hmm. reading the word facade but the word is facade so how do you avoid doing this you check the pronunciation on google but you check british pronunciation if you are in america you check american pronunciation so this is how you increase your vocabulary it's not essential to utilize these words in conversation because then this is ostentation so for instance a person uh, his vocabulary he has a, a very high standard of vocabulary but he goes to the masjid and he's communicating with people simple folk meaning simple folk in the sense they do not understand these words and he utilizes these words then he is what falling into ostentation it's essential to utilize these words when necessary so like this you increase your vocabulary and an increase of vocabulary leads to an increase of thinking because when you want to express yourself or articulate something the the number of words that you have you will be more descriptive and be able to express your thoughts in a cogent and coherent manner that people are able to understand what you are attempting to relay 
or to uh, to impart to them. So it's essential to increase our vocabulary. Uh, never overestimate your abilities uh, in terms of vocabulary, thinking that you have su a sufficient amount of vocabulary. No, at all times, language is increasing. So our knowledge of language should also increase. And this is what is alluded to in 1984, in the book 1984, uh, with regard to language when they burn dictionaries and they write new dictionaries. Why do they do this? The government, the, the, in George Orwell's Orwellian uh, 1984, why are they burning dictionaries? Why are they, bur why are they writing new words? To decrease thinking. So if you decrease vocabulary, you decrease thinking. If you increase vocabulary, you increase thinking. You, you have words to express different feelings. This is why young children, uh, it's good to teach them to express how they feel. So if a two-year-old says, I feel angry, he's expressing what he feels. He says, I am hungry. I am worried. <coughs> He can only do this with vocabulary. Similarly, an ad adult may want to express himself. Now, what happens if they cannot express themselves vocally? Then they will express themselves through other means. So no wonder on Eid Day, on Alam Rock Road, on Coventry Road, on Lady Pool Road, that's it, people attempting to express themselves. Because they cannot do so through vocabulary. So... It's essential to increase vocabulary so we can express ourselves. Someone dies, we feel grief, we feel sorrow. But we cannot express that because we do not know the right words to say. So what do we do? We wail. But if we had the right words to say, I feel grief, I feel sorrow, I feel intense expression. It's essential to increase vocabulary. So... As you will keep reading, some words may not stick. But as you increase your reading, when you come across those words in reading, you will be familiarize yourself with, with those terms. Uh, similarly, when you read in a particular field, how do you start reading in a particular field? So we enter now the domain of academia, education, Islamic and non-Islamic education. You start with the primers the basic books are on that subject so even in english if you go to waterstones and now with uh, technology with the kindle even bookstores are uh, going out of business because people acquire digital copies of books but if you acquire digital copies or uh, hard copies of it, of books you will notice that they have sometimes some publishers have a series of books on ha uh, uh, the famous ones are what for dummies for dummies so uh, the dummies guide to the dummies guide to similarly you have other smaller works you have uh, some publishers publishing smaller works uh, ha uh, the uh, uh, an introduction to so an introduction to philosophy an introduction to sociology an introduction to uh, English literature, an introduction to... These are good books to acquire. And they're small. When you... Now you want to gain knowledge in a particular field. You gain the basic primer in that field. You acquire the basic primer. When you acquire the basic primer, you read through the basic primer, you underline all the jargon, the technical terms, what we refer to as istalahat, and you memorize the istalahat. You memorize the technical terms. Once you have memorized the technical terms, you increase your reading of that subject. You can sometimes refer to the bibliography within the first primer. Within the bibliography, you'll find a guide, a, a guidelines of what further reading to carry out. One of the best ways of reading is interaction. So places like this library Places like the masjid, it, when you meet Islamic scholars, they are experts in their fields. Similarly, you meet your professor at university. He's a, an expert in his field. So, you, like I said, 
you take your knowledge from the mouths of men because they will impart experience to you in a short amount of time. They will direct you. So someone who reads on economy, you may want to understand the economic system. We may have simple questions regarding the monetary system. How does money work? Why do we not just print out money? Meaning a simple uh, people will say a country can simply just print out money and increase uh, their economic uh, GDP. But the answer, as you would know, is not as simple as that. We would need to know how the economy works. So for that, you acquire a book on the economy. And then you talk to people who work in the economic field. They will guide you to read uh, people who are left leaning. They will guide you to lefty books. People who are right leaning, they will guide you to right books. But of course, we're Muslims. We have our own Islamic economic system. But we read those books nevertheless. We benefit and acquire knowledge. We increase our knowledge of the world. Similarly, with any field of interest you may have, whether Islamic or non-Islamic, you start with the primers, you check the bibliographies, and you go to the experts in those fields. If you have no access, then go out your way to access them, or you can even check. Then the internet has its uses. You can check the internet also and check which books are uh, are the right books to read in that particular field. So th this is done even in your courses in university or college or wherever you may study, you acquire the basic primers. In the Islamic field, it is similar. So if someone wanted to ac excel in Ilmul Balagha, which is Arabic rhetoric, he can acquire now even English books. So uh, our local sheikh, a sheikh Zain Hood, who keeps a low profile, but has written so many beneficial works, uh, has written a work on Ilmul Balagha, on rhetoric. So you acquire this basic primer. You go, this is for the students in Madaris. You read through the book, you write down all the mustalahat, the technical jargon, you memorize the jargon, you go and converse with students who are advanced, with ulama, you'll gain free experience. The experience is being given to you. So this is how you increase your depth of knowledge through reading in a particular field, whatever field may interest you. Of course, some people may not want to excel in every field, but they have their own particular fields of interest. So the, uh, being... It's like having a restaurant that serves one dish but serves it good. Yes, mm -hmm. if you attempt to serve too many different dishes but you're not good at making one dish, then you will suffer in all, uh, your restaurant will fail in all the other dishes. Similarly, if you have a few, uh, 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 an expertise, you advance yourself in that expertise, you may read on other subjects also. So. This is how we become habitual readers. Eventually, over the, the weeks and the, the months, some of you may even start reading a book a day. A book a day. There are people who read one book on a, a day. Non-Muslims and Muslims, they can read a book a day or a book every few days or a book a week. The minimum should be a book a week. But... This is what I refer to as power reading. Power reading is sitting for long hours and actually going through a book. Even uh, while living uh, daily lives, carrying out your daily chores, your, your domestic chores, doing your duties, even during that, you can still read very quickly. There are methods of reading books and completing books very quickly. Some people prefer hard copies. Most people prefer hard copies. You can carry the book around with you. And whenever you find free time, you concentrate and you read a few pages. And then if you are distracted, you close the book on the bookmark and you carry on uh, carrying, uh, carry on with your uh, daily duties. This is how people become habitual readers. And what we need in our community now more than ever of course, in the past, 
there were people who could not read and write, but their standard of lifestyle and adab, manners, and akhlaq were higher of a higher standard than those who can read and write today. In our community, we've had people who came from uh, Pakistan, Kashmir, India, Bangladesh, from those societies being raised pre-partition in more simple times, but they were raised with what? Adab and akhlaq, manners, and what else? Usul, principles of life. Principles of life. That was for, for people who came from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh in those times, but also non-Muslims in this country. Even non-Muslims who had adab and akhlaq, like my grandfather mentions, mentioned when he came in the early 1950s. He was in Keithley looking for a job. And a young boy... He saw my granddad and he said, I know a teacher, a school teacher who speaks your language. So he took my grandfather to his school. My grandfather met the teacher, the teacher knew Urdu. He was a colonel in the army in India. And my grandfather was also a part of the army. So they conversed and he said, I found a job for you. Go to this factory with this letter and say to them I sent you so my grandfather went to the factory he gave a letter they said on his recommendation we employ you now look at these simple akhlaq good manners of the English people at that time and this is what when uh, the founder of central masjid Haji Zaman. Haji Zaman there's a video of Haji Zaman when he's asked regarding the rise of the right uh, the, the, the rise of the right in the 1970s in, Engl in England. He says the good English have gone because he came here in the 1930s. Well, to read after going through all this process, does it mean you'll become a good human being? The answer is no. This is where a few things come into this. Al Imam Sufyan Athawri Ta'ala said, before we acquired knowledge, we acquired akhlaq and adab. Before we acquire, acquired knowledge, we acquired akhlaq and adab, manners, and we increased our ibadah. This is one. Number two, having good company. Be with good people. Number three, never to be arrogant, even if Allah has given us abilities. Never to deprecate those who have not been given those abilities. So if you have even memorized the entire English dictionary, when you meet someone who hasn't, never to denigrate that individual, never to look down upon them. Even if someone has acquired so much knowledge, they can never look down on other fellow human beings. The purpose of knowledge is to guide those who are misguided. The purpose of knowledge is to instruct those who are uh, misguided or those who have lost their way or those who are unfamiliar or those who are jahil. Uh, meaning just remember the story of the Bedouin who entered the Masjid Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi Al-Sharif and he urinated in the Masjid and how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade the companions from stopping him because while he was passing water, they would have harmed him and increased the impurity in the masjid. So he said, let him finish and then summoned him and then instructed him saying the masjid was not created for this. The masjid is a place of worship. Instructed the ignorant man. So the purpose of knowledge is to instruct those who do not know. The purpose of reading and becoming good readers is to open the portals of our mind in order that we do not have a narrow outlook on the world, a, a myopic outlook on the world, that we open our scope of thinking within within, or with the light of Islam, with, with the light of Islam, and to acquire uh, those good akhlaq and adab, 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to become readers. And remember the month of, we are in Rajab now. Next month is Sha'ban. When the month of Sha'ban would, would approach, a Salafu Salihun would close all their books except the Quran. They would increase the recitation of the Quran. So for Sha'ban and Ramadan, uh, we should increase our recitation of Al Quran Al Karim. They would also extract their zakat from their wealth and distribute the zakat in Sha'ban. Why? So the poor people have food to have suhoor and iftar. So the month of Rajab is here, a blessed month. Next month is the month of Sha'ban. Uh, inshallah, we should increase our recitation of Al Quran Al Karim, our understanding of Al Quran Al Karim. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this library a success as well as the masjid and whatever is planned for the masjid to be a center of learning inshallah. Like all the uh, masajid within Birmingham uh, in Lozell's Road, we've started Darsin Nizami. Darsin Nizami has started on the weekends in Lozell's Road. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make that a success in our own masjid in South Birmingham Central uh, Masjid known as SBC Masjid on College Road. There are Darsin Nizami classes and the activities of this Masjid, Gumgul Sharif, that the Darus that have started Al Adab Al Mufrad of Al Imam Bukhari, meaning a book which is on manners. So Molana Anis has selected a book on manners, inshallah, a book beneficial. And similarly, Molana Mubashir that these two, they continue the work in this masjid and they the purpose of the masjid is to make the masjid mu'ammar, meaning what filled with people, with dhikrullah and with learning. So this masjid, inshallah, is inspired with the activities in the other masjid, but those masjid which do not have those activities May this masjid also inspire those as well, the surrounding masjid, inshallah. That this city, the city of Birmingham, becomes a role model for Muslims in the Western Hemisphere or in the English speak Anglophone Muslims. That th this city has the potential to be a model city in terms of the number of masjid we have and the number of darus that we potentially can have and the number of teachers we have. In that regard, Gamgul Sharif plays a major role in becoming a model masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finish all uh, the problems, any problems internal or external. Also, aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa atubu ilayh. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the uh, Shaykh for his talk. Um, I was regretting uh, not having paper and pen. <coughs> but alhamdulillah this is uh, going to be on our youtube channel gs mosque so afterwards um, like myself inshallah if all of you i would recommend that there's so many uh, integral points mentioned there so many pointers for readers um, i think like myself you might be a dabbler so you like dabbling to books in and out we want to get into reading so there's some excellent points mentioned there inshallah go back and watch the video gs mosque on youtube and benefit from that uh, just to mention a few points and then inshallah for whatever time Sheikh gives you can have uh, a Q&A session every Monday inshallah after Salatul Aisha which is currently 7.15 every Monday we have Al Adab Al Mufrad we've done nearly uh, 200 hadith alhamdulillah Mashallah. every Thursday uh, same time after Salatul Aisha uh, Sheikh Mubashir is delivering the Durus on the Quran so he's doing select chapters of Juz Amma and giving a commentary on that inshallah that's every thursday brothers will be in the hall uh, in the masjid and sisters are here in the library the library times uh, for the time being monday to friday from 12 to 6 for brothers so monday to friday from 12 to 6 for brothers and for sisters it's wednesday and friday in the morning from 9 to 12 that's for the sisters and as we have more brothers and sisters using, we can change the time around as well. So that just depends on the usage. For the sisters, every Friday in the morning from 10 to 11.30, hour and a half, we have a session um, where one of our teachers, uh, we have a session leading to Ramadan called 
uh, roadmap, roadmap to a productive Ramadan where the teacher should be covering different texts uh, for example the etiquettes of reciting Quran from Imam Nawawi's at Tibyan, etiquettes of Salah um, how to have a productive Ramadan so that session is a session for sisters that will take place here inshallah so that's Monday, Thursday and Friday and every Saturday after Isha we have a gathering of dhikr taking place in the masjid and inshallah soon we will have uh, more events uh, taking place also we have uh, a study circle a book reading study circle every first Thursday of the month where students of the Rasail of Ustad Badiw Zaman Sayyid Nursi Rahimahullah Ta'ala will be here inshallah so we have Turkish brothers from in and around Birmingham the first Thursday of every month um, after Maghrib before the Dars of the Quran they'll be here in the library having a study circle covering Ustad Badiw Zaman's Rasail Nur so that inshallah is an excellent opportunity for all uh, brothers inshallah so keep up to date with what's happening here at Gumgol Sharif you can follow us on social media you have Facebook Instagram GS Mosque and of course on YouTube as well GS Mosque and um, if you have any ideas after Salah Aisha inshallah do approach a brother Sadiq or brother Hasib or Lama Bashar or myself or Hafiz Ikram brothers who are connected with the masjid give us your feedback Tell us about any plans that you have, how you'd like to serve the community as well. And also give us the feedback of today's dars, what you think about the dars, how it could have improved from our perspective as the organizers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all for attending. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the shaykh for taking out time. Inshallah. If you have any questions, I just raise your hands and the shaykh will choose whoever. So when you're reading, how do you distinguish between useful information and uh, non-useful information and then after that how do you retain that information in your memory so what to do in that regard is firstly whatever you find beneficial you'll know intuitively yourself you make notes in the inside cover so for instance you write on page 67 you write page 67 and you write the point that you found beneficial in pen you write that in the inside cover in pen why because later when you refer back to the book you'll have a list of all the useful information that you need to refer back to or you may have needed uh, in the future so uh, like that that information will remain how you discern useful and non-useful you will know that yourself I mean this is useful for me depending on what purpose you're reading the book for so for instance if you're reading the book for uh, let's say a lecture on I'm going to give a lecture on the life of Imam Bukhari I read a book on Imam Bukhari and I make notes of all the points that I want to mention in the lecture so that's beneficial for me in that regard but if I'm reading the same book for a dars on Sahil Bukhari I will highlight different points more technical points so this varies from the purpose of reading the book So with that, what you do is you note taking while reading. So sometimes what what I would do sometimes, very rarely, if I had to read a book that's six, seven hundred pages, after reading the book, I summarize the book. So I write out the summary of the entire book. So there was a book I read on uh, al qatu wa Zan, which is certainty and near certainty, an Arabic book. I borrowed the book from someone, so I didn't have the copy. But I read the book and then I summarized the book and gave him the book back. So I don't need the book because I've summarized the entire book. So then you refer back to the summary and you repeat the summary to yourself. You will memorize the contents of the book. So if uh, again, if you lose concentration on a particular book, you can read multiple books at one time. There's nothing wrong with that. So currently, uh, I may be reading at least 30 books simultaneously. So when I finish one, I'll replace it with another or not replace it, just finish some of the other ones. It's not necessary 
that you read one book cover to cover and then move on to the next. That could be tiring yourself for no reason. You only do that with a book that you find is easy to read. So you finish the book. But if you find it hard, then you can read multiple books at one time. As long as you continuously read them. A lot of difference. So recently we started classes and so many students who applied, they said, can we have these classes online? And I said, no, you must attend the masjid. The reason being, firstly, you value the knowledge. So if people watch the recording they receive the same type of uh, information but they don't value the knowledge mm -hmm. that's one number two there's more baraka so from spark brook i would walk to hazani rasul on Drew's lane so from spark brook to Drew's lane is what f about five miles and then walk back on a daily basis that made me what appreciate the knowledge but it also gave me the value of the knowledge but the knowledge then was given baraka blessings so now you may have students they may study the same thing but there's lack of baraka in their knowledge because they didn't value the knowledge so the value the lack of valuing that knowledge there's no baraka in their learning so that's another thing that firstly you value the knowledge Secondly, there's baraka in your learning. Baraka means what? That you may have less, but there's uh, more out outcome of that knowledge. But then, uh, thirdly, when you meet someone face to face, there are other spiritual things like someone reading hadith. He breathes the same air as you. You breathe the same air. He did that with his teacher all the way back to the Prophet Sallallahu so there are other considerations as well. People online, what they do, watching the video, they let the video play, they may do something else, eat something while they're watching the video, watch the video for entertainment. Like today's lecture was on reading and we have, even though the attendees were limited, but a limited number of people wanted to attend in the first place. But if it was a, uh, an entertainment topic, like a debate mm -hmm. or something that entertains the public, uh, they would turn out in their droves. So this is as also one of the harms of uh, the entertainment industry on, on YouTube. So if you've got a group of people that are interested in learning, so they've shown some sort of nows towards learning, would you say focus them on, on self-development and focus on mastery for example how to learn how to understand oneself yes so again uh, as i mentioned the, the old ulama would say what you're expressing in their old style by saying we learned akhlaq and adab but what is akhlaq and adab what you mentioned mastering the self additionally a person can benefit from books like Ihya al din but also self-help books, modern self-help books are also very useful. So those are recommended for students of knowledge to read books. Even something like Sun Tzu's Art of War is beneficial. So uh, self-improvement is essential while learning, especially in the first year of Darsin Nizami in the first year, it's essential. Yes, so there's some people who uh, utilize audiobooks. I would highly recommend audiobooks and also the Kindle Black and White is recommended. Kindle Black and White is good. So are audiobooks. So you, w you go for your daily walk, you place your he headphones and you walk and you listen. It's absolutely fine because listening is a skill also. Concentrating on the listening. 
Shall we stop there? Jazallah wa anna Sayyidina Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallama ma huwa ahluh. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. After the salah, we got brothers from, mashallah, around. Uh, we got brothers from Sheffield, from, uh, from London, from Burton. Mashallah, after salah.